Hello friends, this is Grief speaking. Today we're continuing our journey into the many works of Junji Ito, as I explain every one of his stories. This video we're going to look at more short stories as we work our way through the Alley and Liminal Zone collections. I just want to give a quick thank you for all the support for this series so far and all the new subscribers. I would have never guessed that these videos would blow up the way that they have, so thank you guys so much. But enough bootlicking, let's just get right into the video. This is Every Single Junji Ito Manga Explained, Part 4. Okay, so let's get into Alley. This is another short story collection, and I believe the most recently released, coming out just a few months ago. So let's get to it. Why not start with the story the collection is named after, Alley. This story follows a student, Ishida, who rents out a room in a small boarding house. The woman renting it says that her husband ran off one day and that they could really use the money. As Ishida explores the neighborhood, he notices an alley by the house that's completely walled off. As he examines it, a strange man watches him from afar. He heads back to the house for dinner and and meets the landlady's daughter, Shinobu. Apparently, the room Ishida is renting used to be hers. One night, Ishida begins hearing what sounds like children playing outside of his window, and it seems like it's coming from the blocked off alley. He tries to tell him to shut up, but to no avail. So, out of irritation and curiosity, he begins to climb over to the wall to see what all the racket is. After almost falling in the process, he realizes it's too dark to see what's going on in the alley. He explains what happened to Shinobu, and she says that she often heard strange noises as well when she was in this room. Later, Ishida begins hearing the voices again, but this time they seem to be calling out Shinobu's name. The next day, Ishida is approached by the man who was watching him before. The man says that years ago he rented the same room, and he has something he has to tell Ishida. He says inside the alley is a hatch that contains the bodies of three dead kids, and that on the alley wall are three stains shaped just like them. He says that at night the kids jump out of the wall and play in the alley, and that he saw this out of the room window. Ishida shrugs the guy off, assuming he's making it up up, especially since there's no window facing the alley. However, Ishida can't stop thinking about the story and the window the man mentioned. He checks behind the bookcase on the wall facing the alley, and sure enough, he finds a covered window as well as some rope. Looking into the alley, the man's story is confirmed as there is a hatch and the stains of three children on the wall, as well as three more stains resembling adults. There's also disturbing and violent graffiti written all over the walls. Ashita lifts up the hatch to find corpses shoved inside and immediately starts heading back to call the cops. As he climbs the rope back up to the window, someone suddenly appears with a knife and stabs him between his fingers, causing him to fall. Turns out, the attacker is Shinobu. She explains that when she was a kid, she ruled this alley, and that she wanted it all to herself. So when she found three other kids playing in it, she killed them and stashed their bodies in the hatch. After this, the stains appeared, and the children came out of the walls at night. Her father found the bodies and walled off the alley, knowing it was probably Shinobu. Next, she lured two classmates she hated to the alley and murdered them as well. Her father had had enough at this point, and she killed him too. Once again, stains appeared, and they too came out of the walls, calling to Shinobi, who found pleasure in their suffering. Man, this chick is twisted. I guess due to blood loss, Ashita passes out, and Shinobu climbs down to dispose of his body before dark. However, as she descends, the rope snaps, leaving her trapped in the alley. She immediately panics, realizing she can't be stuck in here after dark. But with no way out, she cowers in the corner. She then watches in horror as the stains on the walls start protruding out, and the bodies begin to take shape. Descent. In a small town, one year an unusual amount of suicides begin happening. And this story begins when a man finds his wife attempting to hang herself. Luckily, she survives and is brought to the hospital. The man says that he found a note she left that simply said, something strange is going to happen to this town. The nurse tells him that, weirdly enough, all the people who have killed themselves recently left the exact same note when they died. Later that night, a homeless man witnesses a mass of people walking somewhere. They don't respond to him and their eyes are closed. It seems the man's wife from earlier joined them as he finds her gone from the hospital the next day along with a large number of other patients. As the town rallies to try and find the missing people, someone finally spots a person. The man's wife is hanging from a tall tree branch. He takes her back home, but she just stays in bed all day, muttering to herself. Things like, it's awful, it's horrible, and why didn't you let me die? At one point, she suddenly begins to float toward the ceiling and just hovers in the air. The townspeople continue searching for the others with no luck. Then one day, the man's wife suddenly shoots up from bed and screams, they're falling down, they're falling down. She then says, look out the south window, and sure enough, a body 
falls from the sky landing nearby. They find the body and discover it to be one of the missing people. His face is twisted as if he'd seen some unspeakable horror. Later, the man's wife cries out again that three more are falling from the north, and three more of the missing people come falling out of the sky and crashing to the ground below. After this, the town places nets all around, hoping to catch any falling people. The homeless man who saw the people that night they disappeared speaks up, saying he actually saw what happened to him, but was afraid that no one would believe him. The people all climb to the top of a hill outside of the town, and as they reach the top, they began floating up into the infinite sky. Later, some of the townspeople kidnap the man's wife, hoping that killing her will stop the people from falling. As the man frantically fights to save his wife, the townspeople manage to throw her off of a tall building. But instead of falling to the ground, she begins to float instead. As she rises up into the sky, she reaches for her husband, saying, help me, please, it's horrible, it's horrible. As she continues to drift off into the sky, something even worse happens. All the missing people, hundreds of them, begin falling, littering the streets with corpses as they all crash to the ground. The story ends as the man describes the terrified faces of the dead, who must have witnessed some cosmic horror as their bodies traveled into some other realm, only to be sent falling back to Earth. He also says that the only missing person they didn't find was his wife, and that perhaps one day she'll come falling down. The Ward the ward begins with a car crash. The two women involved in the crash, Hashimoto and Suzy, end up with minor injuries in the same hospital ward. The two immediately begin arguing over whose fault the accident was, and Hashimoto says her face feels steamy, but assumes it to be a side effect from the crash. She also notices the other three women in the ward are pretty weird. They talk to each other in their sleep as if they're having the same dream, and they all get up to go to the bathroom at the same time because they hate being separated. The doctor mentions that they haven't been eating their meals either, but their bodies seem to be fine. Mind, suggesting that they have some kind of mental condition. They're starting to remind me of the kids from the Village of the Damned. Anyway, Susie won't stop harassing Hashimoto about how she needs to compensate her for all her medical expenses, still claiming the wreck was her fault. Finally, Hashimoto asks if she can change wards. She gets moved to her own room, but late at night, a creepy-ass old man crawls out from a hole in the wall behind a shelf. I mean, that's pretty scary by itself. He starts making his way toward her, saying he's from an all-male ward in the next room. Luckily, the nurse comes in and scolds the old perv. But next thing you know, Susie comes running out into the hall screaming. She says that the three weird women in the ward have tentacles coming out of their mouths and are trying to crawl into hers. But the three girls are standing there and nothing seems to be happening. Later, the doctor and nurse have a conversation about how strange everyone's been. They mentioned that originally only one girl was acting weird, but slowly the other two joined her after saying similar things to Susie. They speculate whether Susie will end up like them as well. And later that night, the four of them exit their ward and it's now clear they do in fact have many snake-like tentacles coming out of their mouths, each with a needle at the end of it. They kill the nurse and doctor and make their way to Hashimoto's room, but before they enter, she manages to sneak through the hole in the wall. One of the girls finds her in the other room, and as she enters, Hashimoto slams the door shut, severing the tentacles, which causes the girl to shrivel up. As Hashimoto runs towards the exit, we hear the hive mind being shouting that they'll find her eventually. The end. A girl named Mitsuyo explains how when she was young, her father went mad. He suddenly decided to try and make their house into an inn and bathhouse without the consent of his wife. He tears up the floor in one room and starts digging, saying that there must be a hot spring under the ground. At this point, Mitsuyo and her mom are well freaked out as her dad continues to dig a deep hole, completely sure this is a spring. He said he was told this by his ancestors in a dream. One day, a couple of travelers show up looking for a place to stay, and he invites them in as guests, saying it's only a matter of time before the hot spring comes up, since he's now dug 20 meters deep. At this point, the wife completely snaps at him, saying he needs to give up on this absurd idea, as it's been two months of this nonsense. Meanwhile, the travelers are just standing there like, uh, maybe we should go. Mitio's mother decides they have to leave the crazy man, and she passes packs their bags. Michio then looks down the hole as her father digs below. Suddenly a plume of steam shoots up and surprisingly a hot spring does emerge from the ground. Her father climbs his way out, now burnt pretty badly, but instead of getting medical help, he begins the next phase of his work, turning the room into a proper bathhouse. Michio and her mother finally leave after this, never to return. Now in the present, an adult Michio is telling the story to her boyfriend who is fascinated, saying he wants to go see if the bathhouse is still there. Michio refuses, saying she 
couldn't face her father. Plus, the bathhouse is known to attract really bizarre and disturbing customers. So the boyfriend decides to check it out alone. After asking around, he finds the inn was illegally shut down by authorities, but he still continues his search. He finally finds the place with a sign that reads, Hell's Bathhouse. He's greeted by Michio's father, who looks worse for the wear and seems to still be running the place illegally. As they walk down the hall, the boyfriend spots a really creepy looking man pass by him with scars on his head. He's led to his room and Michio's father tells him to be careful in the hot spring as there's a one meter wide hole in the center. He then enters the spring, which is already inhabited by some really scary looking fellas. Seriously, would you still get into this thing after you saw this guy? He mentions to the other patrons that the water is red as if it's a pool of blood and one of the dudes just immediately responds saying it is a blood pool and that the water surges straight from hell. Then another horrifying man emerges from the center of the pool, followed by dozens more. Mitio's boyfriend finally concludes that this is in fact a portal to hell. He then witnesses the demons put on a wicked party in the end, saying it was no different than being in hell itself, and then he passes out. When he wakes up, he finds the inn is completely deserted and in ruins. He wonders if the whole thing was a dream until he wanders into the bathhouse once more and the pool is completely drained. However, there is steam rising from the hole and strange noises echoing up from below. Blessing. This story follows a young couple, Kyosuke and Misuzu. The two wish to get married, but Misuzu's father won't give his blessing, telling Kyosuke he will never let him marry his daughter no matter how many times he asks. Her brother chimes in as well, calling Kyosuke a lower class loser. Kyosuke says he's done all he can and if Mizuzu won't marry him without her father's consent, then they just have to end it. Later, Kyosuke goes out with a friend from work, Yuko, and he finds himself getting feelings for her. One day, Mizuzu's brother shows up out of the blue and says he's changed his mind about Kyosuke and that he wants him to marry Mizuzu, telling him to ask his father once more. He even gives him a bottle of his father's favorite drink, hoping this would soften him up. Kyosuke can't deny that he still has feelings for Mizuzu and decides to try again. And once again, her father says no. Later, Kyosuke is back hanging out with Yuko when Mizuzu shows up ready to take Kyosuke to ask permission. It's kind of an awkward moment, but Kyosuke ends up going with Mizuzu anyway. On the car ride, she asks him about Yuko, whether this is his new girlfriend or what. Kyosuke realizes he can't toy with them like this and tells Mizuzu that he is in love with Yuko. He tells her goodbye one last time and exits the car. The next day, Yuko doesn't show up to work and is apparently in the hospital. Kyosuke goes to meet her and finds that she's already dead, and he blames himself for this since he left her the night before. Misuzu shows up to Kyosuke's place to find him crying and comforts him all night. There's a time jump here and Kyosuke is now in his 30s and a successful orthodontist. He and Misuzu are a couple again and they regularly visit Misuzu's father to ask for his blessing. After getting yet another no, Misuzu's brother continues to encourage Kyosuke to keep on asking. As they head out, Kyosuke realizes he forgot his bag and when he goes to retrieve it, he overhears a conversation between Misuzu's father and brother. Her father tells his son to keep up the good work, as he says continually telling them no makes his life worth living. Damn, that's pretty evil. After this, Kyosuke begins to bring Mizuzu's father his favorite drink, but is secretly poisoning it, hoping to kill him in an act of revenge. As time goes on, her father does begin to weaken and get sick, until finally he's hospitalized. On his deathbed, the father reveals a shocking truth. The night that Kyosuke broke up with Mizuzu all those years ago, she actually committed suicide. All this time, it was Mizuzu's ghost that came along with Kyosuke. Her father wanted the couple to keep seeking his blessing just so that he could keep seeing his daughter's ghost as her spirit only follows Kyosuke. In despair, Kyosuke speculates that perhaps Yuko was cursed by Mizuzu's ghost and that might be why she died. He looks out of his window and sees the ghost of Mizuzu once more beckoning him, saying, our marriage is finally approved. Smokers Club. This is a shorter one. It follows a group of high school students who form a smoking club where they sneak off to smoke cigarettes. The cigarettes produce a really dark smoke. A new student joins the club and says that they taste unsettling as if he smoked something he shouldn't have. Nakaya, the group's leader, explains that he rolls the cigarettes himself and that he gathers the tobacco leaves from outside of a crematorium, saying that the leaves are high quality because the human ashes settle in the soil and create fertilizer. Nakaya says he loves the moment when he breathes out and feels like he's seeing dark Darkness. Then he exhales and the smoke escapes from his eyes as well. The other students do the same and the new guy's like, 
I'm out of here. This is weird. His friend decides to try and go to the crematorium to steal all the tobacco leaves for himself, and as he smokes a cigarette, his entire body is consumed in the dark smoke. We then see another student stating, it's all darkness before my eyes, as the smoke leaves from every orifice on his head. And that's where it ends. It's a short one and kind of a weird one. Mold. Mold follows a man named Akasaka returning home to Japan after a year in America. He comes back to his house and finds that it's disgusting and covered in mold. Apparently, he reluctantly leased the house to an old high school teacher of his, Mr. Rogi, and the condition the house is left in is only reaffirming his ill feelings towards the teacher. He left his brother Seiji in charge as the landlord while he was gone and chews the poor guy out over the whole thing. After cleaning the house as best he can, he decides to relax in the tub and remembers one year previously when he met with Mr. Rogi and his family. Akasaka had reason for not liking the guy as he was kind of a dick to him as a teacher for no reason. He mentions that the teacher was particularly interested in studying fungus and that there were rumors he would even conduct experiments in his own home. Seji insists that Akasaka talk to the family about potentially leasing the place while he's gone, and although the family is really weird, he eventually gives in. The strangest thing is their baby, which randomly starts crying bloody murder, and the mother seems to purposely hide its appearance. Back in the present, Akasaka wakes in the morning to find that the walls of the house all have a strange texture, like they have mold on them, and this gets worse on the second floor, leading to one of the rooms which is locked. Seji seems to know something about what's going on, and Akasaka demands he tell him what's up. He says that the family's previous home was mysteriously burnt down and urges Akasaka to leave the house before something bad happens here as well. Well, Akasaka presses his brother further and finally gets the full truth. One day, Seji stopped by the house and found a disturbing sight. The family's baby was crawling around completely covered in mold, his face utterly deformed by it. He then says that the eldest daughter was infected by the fungus as well. He theorizes that Mr. Rogi must have created a new breed of fungus with rapid growing capabilities, and that this must be the reason Rogi burned down his house before. Seji warns Akasaka to leave one more time before he takes off. The house continues to get worse, with strange tubes growing through the house that drip a black liquid, and Akasaka explains that somehow he lost the will to leave the house. He follows the tubes to the room with a locked door. Due to all the mold, the door has rotted, and Akasaka easily breaks it open to find a room that looks like a moldy hell. More disturbing than the mold, he spots several bodies covered in tubes. It appears the family was here all along, mutating to become part of the moldy house itself. Man, that's pretty freaky. Kind of reminds me of that creep show short, where Stephen King plays a dumb farmer that gets covered in mold. Anyway, Akasaka finds his skin has become itchy, and we see that he's also turning to mold. He sits in the room as the mold and tubes start breaking down his body, now trapped in the house just like the rogies. Memory this story follows a teen girl named Rie who is very beautiful. However, sometimes when looking in the mirror, she gets an uneasy feeling. Was she always this beautiful? She has a strange memory from when she was seven where she's sitting by her mother looking into a mirror. In the memory, she has an ugly face, but when she looks through her old album, she doesn't see this face anywhere. There aren't many photos of her between the ages of seven and 14, and her memory is completely blank during that time. So what happened to her, and what does this have to do with the horrid face? Well, Rie freaks out and confronts her parents, suggesting that somehow her face changed in that time period, although they do exchange a glance as if they know something. And once Rie leaves the room, she overhears them talking. They say that Rie has forgotten what happened. They don't say exactly what it is that she's forgotten, but her mother says that she's hidden most of the photos of that child, except for one photo she's kept in her drawer. After hearing this, Rie sneaks into her parents' room and finds the photo. It's exactly the face from her memory. She begins to believe that this hideous face must represent her evil self. She relates herself to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, speculating that during the memory gap between 7 and 14, her alternate face took over. Afraid that she could lose her memory again, she begins to keep an extremely detailed diary of everything that happens to her every day. Her parents are getting worried and discuss the incident once more, implying that Rie killed someone before, and it had something to do with her believing she was ugly. As they talk, she stumbles into the room holding a mirror. In the mirror, her face has changed to look like the hideous face from before. She she screams at her mother, blaming her for giving birth to such a hideous face, and pulls out a knife to try and kill both her parents. Her father stops her and shows her the mirror once again, telling her she's not ugly. Sure enough, her reflection is beautiful. He explains she's never been ugly, and that the girl in her memory isn't her, but rather her sister Keiko. Apparently, Keiko was Rie's fraternal twin. Rie was terrified that she might become ugly like her sister, and so she strangled her to death. Her parents then told the police it was a suicide, and Rie blocked out the memory. 
memory. As Rie recalls the death of her sister once more, she's relieved knowing that she's dead because she can't turn ugly like her. And it seems that Rie has now blocked out the memory once again, enjoying her beauty in the mirror. Town of No Roads. Okay, settle in for this one. It's quite a bit longer than the other stories. It follows Sayako, a teen girl who's been having weird dreams lately. She keeps dreaming about a boy in her class, Kishimoto. He isn't particularly remarkable, and she doesn't even really know him, but keeps dreaming about him nonetheless. Because of this, she begins to think that maybe she subconsciously has a crush on him. One of her friends suggests that Kishimoto is using the Aristotle way, a method of getting your crush to like you where you sneak into their room at night and whisper into their ear while they sleep. This causes them to dream of you and then hopefully start to be interested in you. Well, that's creepy as hell. Also, just a side note, I can't figure out any real association with Aristotle or why they call it the Aristotle way. Other than Aristotle did have a short work on dreams where he mentions how dreams can be reflections on our experiences and emotions. So it seems like a pretty loose connection. Anyway, during dinner one night, one of Saiko's brothers mentions hearing a boy's voice coming from her room. Her older brother confirms and the family starts to assume that Saiko has been sneaking boys into her room at night. That night, Saiko has another weird dream. Kishimoto approaches her in the dream and gives her a promise ring. But then a creepy dude shows up claiming himself to be Jack the Ripper and slashes Kishimoto up. Saiko wakes up startled to find that the ring box was real and lying open on her bed with the ring missing. Later that day, Kishimoto's body was found, gutted in the street. After this incident, Saiko stays holed up in her room, afraid she could be killed next. A year later, even weirder things have been happening to Saiko. She's staying in her classmate's room, afraid to go home, but after a week, he gets fed up and asks her to leave. She returns home just to be berated by her family, and she says that she left because they've been acting so weird, mostly by spying into her room, something they all deny. She enters her room and we see a handful of holes in the wall, most of which are covered, but it looks like there are some new ones now. Suddenly a hole is poked through one of the paper coverings and a finger comes out. Psycho is freaked out and fed up. She smashes the finger, seemingly breaking it before it disappears. She then sees her parents peeking in through her bedroom door, and worst of all, her brother has made a hole through the wall and into her wardrobe. She pulls him out and asks him why he's spying, and he just says she's being overly defensive and that he was just using it as a fort. At this point, Psycho straight up makes a privacy barricade around her bed. But in the middle of the night, she hears movement from the ceiling and finds that someone has drilled a hole in the boards. She grabs a screwdriver and jams it into the hole. Judging by the screams, she must have stabbed one of her family members in the eye. The next day at breakfast, Saiko's father has a bandage over his eye and her older brother has a finger splint, confirming that the family was in fact spying on her. Once again, the family denies it, saying they got the injuries for other reasons. This is the scariest aspect of this story to me. Your own family acting really weird, but then pretending nothing's going on is kind of freaky. At this point, Saiko decides to run away again because of her family's behavior. She travels to another town to hopefully stay with her aunt who lives alone. She takes a train most of the way, but finds that apparently buses no longer go to this town anymore. As she gets closer to the town, she finds that it's blocked off everywhere. Even the main road into the town has buildings built up blocking it. Stranger than that, everyone seems to be wearing masks in the area. She's approached by a man in a mask who offers to guide her. As they enter the mass of buildings, they just walk through someone's house and the owner seems used to it. They continue through a series of houses and buildings. According to the man, the buildings are mysteriously built at night and even if they are torn down, they just pop back up the next day. Because of this, there are no roads in this town and the only way to travel through is by traversing the many houses and buildings and it seems Saiko's aunt's house is right in the middle of all of it. At one point, they encounter a group of masked people all pissed off because someone closed and locked their door, something that seems frowned upon here. Soon, they use an axe to break down the door so they can walk through the house and tie up the couple inside, beating them with sticks. They call them swine, saying they're trying to ruin the town by closing their doors. Later, Saiko unties the couple. The couple explain that since there are no roads, people insist on traveling through their house, leaving them no space to themselves, and that people have taken to wearing masks just to have even a small amount of privacy. They also mention the strange ones who have recently moved into town as well, and tell Saiko she should wear a mask if she continues to travel here. They give directions to Saiko's aunt, but warn her that there have been all kinds of killings in the area. As she continues, she walks past a few groups of masked people, some of which seem to be watching her. She finally arrives at her aunt's place and she even answers the door, completely topless. Her aunt explains how crazy the town has gotten, with people breaking into her house and climbing through her windows, not to mention the dozens of peepholes all over the house. She says she's just accepted the fact that she has no privacy and so now she walks around naked. She talks about how crazy privacy is using the masks as an example and starts trying to convince Psycho to join her by throwing 
throwing away the mask and her clothes. Saiko tells her aunt that she's lost her mind as she explains her bizarre worldview. Eventually, she brandishes a knife and starts chasing Saiko, trying to cut her clothes off. Saiko is forced to run away, running through all the houses and buildings, completely lost. At one point, she stumbles upon a corpse that slashed up the exact same way as Kishimoto. She also encounters a deformed group of people with extended heads and dozens of eyes, which they use to look through peepholes. These must be the strange ones the couple mentioned earlier. Luckily, she ends up running into the man in the mask who helped her earlier, and he agrees to guide her out. At one point, she notices the man is wearing a ring, and on a closer look, it's actually the promise ring that Kishimoto gave to her in her dream. The man puts the ring on Psycho's finger and then removes his mask, revealing that he is actually Jack the Ripper, the man who killed Kishimoto. He moves in to kill Psycho, but before he does, he's stabbed in the back by her aunt. She simply tells Psycho to follow the stream, which will lead her out of here, and walks away. In the final panel, we see Psycho heading to toward a light at the end of the stream. So yeah, quite a tale this one. It kind of feels like three stories all tied together by the theme of privacy. The first story focuses on the invasiveness of someone breaking into your room at night without you knowing, and even worse, breaking into your dreams. The second part taps into the fear of being watched at all times, and the final part is just a privacy-deprived dystopia. I've seen people come up with various theories as to the meaning of this story, but it's clear that Junji Ito took the emotions around a lack of privacy and tapped into them to create a very specific specific kind of horror. Ice Cream Bus. This one is great because it just kind of feels like a Goosebumps episode. It begins with an ice cream bus showing up on the block in the middle of winter. As all the neighborhood kids enjoy their ice cream, they all enter the bus and they imply that they've ridden the bus a few times. The parents don't care either, they just let the strange man gather up all their kids. So Nahara, a single father who just moved into the neighborhood, asks the other parents what's up and they explain that the ice cream man drives the kids around the block as they eat their ice cream as a free service. So Nahara doesn't let his son Tomo have any ice cream and the kid throws a big fit later. The next time the ice cream bus comes around, Sonohara goes ahead and lets Tomoki join in with the other kids. When he returns, he says that there was a mountain of strawberry ice cream on the bus and that all the kids licked it. At this point, Sonohara is getting a little suspicious. He asks if he can tag along on the next ride, but the ice cream man says there are no adults allowed. He looks inside to see the children all feasting on another huge mound of ice cream pretty gross. Around the house, Sonohara notices that Tomoki has been all sticky lately, probably from the ice cream, but also his toys and even the carpet have all become sticky. Even weirder, while walking home from work, he spots a girl licking another girl's head, and both of their skin seems to be sticky, almost like ice cream. As he arrives home, he spots a horrific sight in his apartment. Tomoki licking a mound of ice cream, and around him seems to be the melted bodies of all of his friends. All the kids have turned into ice cream, and Tomoki starts listing all of his melted friends and what flavors of ice cream they've become. Sonohara tries to stop his son from licking his dead friends, and when he pushes him back, Tomoki's head falls off, melting into ice cream as well. The story ends with the ice cream man rolling up once again. It's kind of a goofy one, but a lot of fun and a light way to end that collection. Now let's move into the liminal zone. This is another short story collection, although it only has four stories. They're all a bit longer than a typical Ito short story, so no time to waste. Let's dig into it. Starting with Weeping Woman Way. A young couple, Mako and Yuzuru are on a trip to Tohoku before their wedding. They look into each other's eyes and almost kiss, but suddenly hear a distracting noise in the distance. Someone is crying loudly, and the couple follows the sobs to a nearby funeral where a woman is crying her eyes out. A man in attendance tells the couple that she's called a weeping woman. Back in the day, people would call a weeping woman to cry at funerals as a service for the dead. Yuzuru then notes that she's doing an excellent job pretending to cry. The man tells them that this is no act. The weeping women in this area know deep sadness making their cries sincere and full of anguish. While watching, Mako suddenly finds herself breaking down and crying as well. Later, the couple reflect on the incident and how Mako can't help but follow suit when others cry. They lean in for another smooch when, once again, they're distracted by the crying woman who's walking down the road. Is this the weeping woman or the cock-blocking woman? Damn. Anyway, as the woman passes, she gives Mako a strange look. After the couple arrives back home, Mako can't help but cry. In fact, she's been crying non-stop since they returned from their trip. This gets to the point that their bed is soaked in tears, and Yuzuru finally takes her to a hospital. The doctors can't find anything wrong, however, and the antidepressant they prescribe doesn't seem to do anything. As they pass by a fortune teller on the street, he randomly shouts at them, saying that the key is in Tohoku. With nothing left to lose, the couple heads back, hoping to find the weeping woman, and maybe some answers. They return to the house the funeral was held at, but the owner says that they never invited a weeping woman, and everyone in town denies their existence. At this point, even Yuzuru starts crying as the two give up hope. Then, finally, they 
they hear a loud wailing coming from the woods and follow after it. They encounter a large swarm of mosquitoes that seem to take the shape of giant faces watching them, and as they clear, the couple discover a strange village. As they walk down the street, they see streams of tears flowing from each house. They encounter a woman who tells them that this place is known as Weeping Woman Way, and that an especially powerful weeping woman lives here. They enter a building to find the woman from the funeral. She says she's been waiting for them to return, and especially wanted to see Mako, saying that she's a rare individual that knows true sadness. She says there's a fundamental sadness in the world that average people only witness when they die. She says that the tears that flow from Mako are the tears of the dead, and that the more tears she sheds, the more people she's helped find peace. She goes on to tell them of a legendary weeping woman known as Orui. 200 years ago, there was a drought that led to famine, killing everyone around Orui. All alone, she began to cry so heavily that her tears spilled over to become a large lake, ending the drought. The weeping woman leads the couple somewhere as the townspeople seem struck by Mako, believing her to be the reincarnation of Orui. They arrive at a shrine that is housing the legendary weeping woman's remains. It appears that even after death, Orui's corpse continued to cry up until recently. Since she stopped crying, many spirits have lingered in the area. The weeping women then ask Mako to cry with them, hoping with her power they can bring back Orui's tears. Mako begins to cry so fiercely that tears gush out of her eyes like faucets, and it seems she's brought Orui's tears back as well. We then see some of the lingering spirits find peace and vanish. However, in a disturbing sequence, Orui sits up and her head collapses and caves in from the tears. Yuzuru grabs Mako and tries to escape, but the weeping women stop him. At the same time, Orui's body completely turns to tears, and the women are desperate to keep Mako here as a replacement. A swarm of spirits once again surround them as Yuzuru fights off the women and somehow escapes with Mako. Back home, Mako continues to cry to the point where they keep buckets by the bed to catch the tears. This constant weeping slowly weakens Mako, and eventually, she dies. Much like Orui, Mako's body continues to cry on after death, and at her funeral, the weeping women burst through the door surrounding her coffin and do what they do best, crying their eyes out. Mako's coffin completely fills with tears, and her body rises up and wails with her eyes flowing like waterfalls. In all the chaos, Mako's body disappeared, but Yuzuru says that it must have been the weeping women taking her back to Weeping Women Way. The story ends with Yuzuru traveling back to Tohoku, something he says he does from time to time, hoping one day he might find the village again. Madonna this story is an overtly religious horror, and it might actually be the only one I've covered so far focusing on religious elements. It follows Maria, a transfer student to Tensei, a Christian academy. It's worth noting that Tensei translates to something like reincarnation. The school is terribly strict. It's surrounded by a tall wall, and you have to have permission to see the outside world. During a prayer meeting, Maria notices the principal staring at her. His wife, the vice principal, is really mean and quick to deal out punishment. Rumor has it she thinks that she She's the Virgin Mary and calls herself Madonna. The kids in the school rearrange the Japanese characters of Madonna to mean angry witch woman. The woman catches Maria and her friend Risa chatting during chapel and forces them to kneel before the cross for two hours. This results in Risa collapsing from exhaustion. Later in their dorm room, the two girls discuss how scary and mean the woman is and Risa says that she hasn't always been this way. That once she was kind and beautiful, resembling the Madonna. The rumors say that she began to change after her husband cheated on her with the Bible. Bible studies teacher. More than that, he was married once before and cheated on that wife with the witch woman. Real symbol of Christ, this guy. As Risa explains this, salt starts falling out of her ear. Okay. Maria strolls around the school and notices some weird shaped stones lying around that look like human body parts. She looks over to see a girl licking one, saying it's salty. Maria then recounts the weird students and teachers she's met since she's been here. In class one day, Maria is summoned to the principal's office. He gives Maria a tour, showing her some previous alumni who went on to be important people, as well as portraits of his current wife when she was younger, and his previous wife as well. He then shows her a portrait of his son, saying that his son and his wife had a falling out, and that he left three years ago, never to be found. The principal then invites Maria to a small church on campus that holds special services for a select few. Oh god, I'm not a Catholic boy, but I know where this is going. Surprisingly, there's an actual service, but it's creepy as hell. There's a statue of Mother Mary with blood running from her eyes. At the same time, the witch woman is dressed like the Virgin Mary, and the students are all praying to her and looking scared as hell. The next day, the principal moves Maria to a special class that's supposedly only for students with deep faith, excellent excellent grades, and beautiful features. Oh god, I wasn't in the choir, but I know where this is going. Surprisingly, this is an actual class, led by Satomi, 
the teacher that the principal supposedly cheated on his wife with. Maria moves into a new dorm and meets her roommate, Akemi, the salt licking girl from earlier. Weirdly enough, the salt begins pouring out of the girl's ear and she starts licking that too. Ugh. Maria offers to help clean her ears and casually asks her about the principal's wife. Even at the mention of the woman, Akemi shudders in fear. In class, Maria notices the Bible teacher and the students are all kind of weird. In fact, they all have salt coming out of their ears. Once again, Maria is summoned to the small church to meet with the principal. She asks him about the salt coming out of everyone's ears and he simply says that salt is a sacred substance and proof of their deepening faith. He goes on to say that his first wife thought she was the Virgin Mary but didn't have Mary's mercy. He says she deserved to be turned to a pillar of salt like Lot's wife in the Bible. He continued to search for the second coming of Mary and met his second wife, but was wrong there as well as she became an angry woman lacking Mary's kindness. He then explains that he believes Maria to be the reincarnation of the Blessed Virgin. He takes her to the back room and starts making moves on her. Aha, I knew molestation was around the corner, I just didn't know when. Before he gets anywhere, his wife enters the church and starts praying. She laments the fact that she's aging and the deep anger she has at her cheating husband. As she does, the statue of Mary begins bleeding from the eyes. She takes some of the blood and rubs it on her own eyes to emulate the tears, but then she notices someone is there. The principal has vanished and Maria begins to run from the terrifying woman. She enters through a random door to hide and sees a disturbing sight. A large pile of bodies made of salt, and at the top, a man of salt crucified on a cross. That night at the special service, the witch woman calls out that there is a spy among the students. However, she incorrectly guesses it to be Akemi. She screams, know the punishment of Mary, and shockingly Akemi is turned to salt. The woman says that those who annoy her simply have their brains turned to salt, but those who anger her are turned to pillars of salt. So I guess that explains why salt was coming from everyone's ears. Maria cries out saying that it was her that was in the chapel. She explains how the principal took her there and declared her the true reincarnation of Mary. The woman turns her hateful eyes on her husband in disbelief as he said she was the Madonna and reveals that she even helped her kill her husband's first wife. The man simply laughs and says once again that Maria is the true Madonna. At the same time, the Bible teacher Satomi is also shocked, saying that she was told that she was the Holy Mother. She even says that she's pregnant with the guy's son that she planned to name Jesus. Basically, this colossal prick keeps promising hot young women that they're the next Mary so he can have sex with them. At this point, the witch woman just loses it. Her face contorts with pure hatred and lightning strikes the chapel, crumbling the head of the Mary statue. In another big reveal, the dude's first wife's body was hidden inside the statue all this time. He wanted to make her stand eternally like Lot's wife as a pillar of salt. Well, his current wife just loses it even more when she realizes she's been praying to this woman's corpse this whole time. Looking like a demon, she turns the entire congregation of students into salt, barely missing her husband who grabbed Maria and escaped to the room with a pile of bodies. He explains that they are all victims of those who have angered the witch in the past and that the man on the cross is actually his son. Apparently three years ago, he didn't run away but was turned into salt. The principal then turns to Maria saying that they'll be married and that he'll impregnate her with the true child. But as he moves in on her, salt comes pouring out of his ears, mouth, and eyes. Eventually, his entire body turns to salt and collapses. Shortly after this, the witch enters the room, ready to turn Maria to salt as she attempts to climb the pile of bodies. Just before the witch can commit the act, the crucifix is knocked loose and comes tumbling down the pile, impaling the witch on its way down. Now that's awesome. Maria takes the opportunity to flee the chapel and the entire thing is struck by lightning, catching fire and crumbling. She explains that no matter how much she insisted, no one ever believed the truth of what happened there. And that is Madonna. The Spirit Flow of Aoki Gahara This story opens with a couple, Norio and Mika, wandering through the forest. Norio was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and rather than suffer, he decided to die on his own terms in Mount Fuji's Sea of Trees. And his girlfriend Mika decided to die with him. As they look for a place to die, the forest gets darker and they see a mysterious glow beyond the trees. They decide to camp out, and the next morning, they investigate where they saw the mysterious light. They find that long lines of trees in the area are all leaning in the same direction and are completely smooth. They follow the path of the trees to a strange cave that almost looks like a dragon. Norio recalls hearing about a mysterious cave called the Dragon's Mouth and apparently something called the Spirit Flow pours out of it. Norio decides he wants to try and see the Spirit Flow before he dies and tells Mika to go home, but she says she'll stay with him. Sure enough, that night the cave emits a glow and they witness a stream of spirits flowing from the dragon's mouth. Norio makes the rash decision to jump into the flow, hoping this will carry him to the land of the dead. But Mika is left behind. Searching hopelessly for Norio the next day, she actually finds him clinging to a tree in the path 
path of the flow. He says he got scared once he jumped in and held onto the tree, and that the spirits that passed him licked his body as they passed. He's even dripping with their spit gross. He also says that he isn't in pain anymore and thinks that the spirit flow healed him. Norio wants to soak in the spirit flow once again, but Mika says she's starving and they must get food and water first. Norio tells her that he isn't hungry, likely a side effect of the spirit flow. He tells her to go home and that he'll return to her in a week after he's entered the flow and gotten even healthier. Two weeks passed and Norio never came home, so Mika returned to the forest to find him. She stumbles upon what looks like a dead body hanging from a tree, only to find that it's actually Norio. The dude looks a little different, kind of thin and alien-like. He introduces Mika to a young man named Mitsuya who came to the forest to die as well, but Norio convinced him to jump into the spirit flow instead. Mika's like, all right, well, it's time to go. That's enough spirit flow. But Norio's like, nah, we're just going to keep jumping into it. Mika refuses to leave without him, and that night she witnesses the two jump into the spirit flow again as if it's a public swimming pool or something. As the days pass, Norio and Mitsuya's bodies continue to change, looking thinner and more polished. One day, a random YouTube vlog shows up and enters the cave as part of a video investigation. He comes clambering out in terror, repeating the phrase streamlined, streamlined, and running out of the forest. Eventually, Norio and Mitsuya look like straight up aliens and are now nude. They start complimenting each other's beautiful bodies and start getting a little freaky licking on each other. Mika's face is hilarious here, it really sums up the whole situation. The two are super condescending to Mika since she hasn't experienced the flow, and that night when it reappears, Mika jumps in as well, only she is completely wild washed away in the flow, probably being carried away to the land of the dead. Meanwhile, the other two decide to check out the cave to see what the YouTuber was on about. They find dozens of strange creatures that can only be described as streamlined. At least that's what they call them. They also find a pool full of the things and find that Mika is swimming in it, telling them she was saved by these people. Apparently, these beings are the result of continuously entering the spirit flow. The three then ride the spirit flow again, and the final page simply says, as to whether or not the spirit flow truly exists in the forest of Aokigahara, only those who reach the Cave of the Dragon's Mouth know. Let's just leave it at that. Well, that's ominous. And next we move into Slumber, the final story of the Liminal Zone collection. It begins with a man named Takuya describing the feelings he has right before he wakes up every morning, when his mind is new and he feels pure bliss. That is, until he awakes and memories of a harsh reality enter his mind. He says he's tortured by the pain of reality, and that this is even worse in the morning after killing somebody. He snaps awake and turns on the news to see a crime scene report. The reporter says the victim was stabbed repeatedly and that the crime resembled an incident from the week before. As he watches the TV, Takia says, I did it again, as memories from the night before flood into his head. He recalls chasing the woman down and stabbing her, then singing the familiar lullaby, Rockabye Baby, as he closes her eyelids. Takuya doesn't understand why he's killing these people. His life is stressful since he wants to be a lawyer and has failed the bar exam three times already, but has this stress caused him to have a psychotic break? The next morning he wakes up again with memories of murder, chanting the lullaby as he slaughters a man in the street, and again the news reports it. He tries to walk it off and calm down, but finds himself going even even more mad. He returns to his apartment to find it unlocked, and when he washes his face in the bathroom, he finds a piece of paper taped over the mirror, something he doesn't remember doing. He opens his closet to find several hooded parkas, the same style he sees himself wearing in his memories. He piles them all up and takes them to the dump. When he returns to his apartment, he tries desperately not to fall asleep as he's afraid of what he'll do, but he can't hold out for long and passes out. Once again, he remembers a murder, and this time the news captured surveillance video of a man in a parka near the crime. Takia's friend and or girlfriend Konami shows up asking why he turned his phone off. She makes him dinner and they decide to watch some TV, but when a show about a killer comes on, Takia freaks out and confesses he's a murderer. Konami calms him down and tries to come up with some explanations for all of this. She also tells him about a man named Tomo Yano who was given the death penalty 10 years earlier for a string of murders that closely resemble the murders happening today, meaning that there is either a copycat killer on the loose or that Tomo was innocent. She mentions that even weirder, Tomo turned himself in. The two decide that they can get a camera tomorrow and record Takuya sleeping to see if he does leave in the night. Takuya begs Konami to stay with them tonight and she obliges, but once Takuya falls asleep she heads out saying she has a thing. You have a thing? Really? Your boyfriend might be a murderer and you have to get to a thing? Eh, maybe I'm being a little harsh. Well, she ends up getting attacked while walking home, and I have to say, the image here is horrifying. The face of the killer is blurred, but it kind of looks like a real image that's edited or something. I can't really explain it. It looks like it could be an early creepypasta or something. Konami manages to pepper spray the attacker, and although she was sliced up pretty good, she managed to survive and is currently in the hospital. A detective comes in and gets some information from the doctor that Konami knew the attacker 
attacker and that he was none other than Takuya's neighbor, Ryoji Gabara, who Konami had seen on several occasions. This guy looks creepy as hell. We see him in a final crime report about the suspect and get a look at some of his journals where he details his crimes. We learn in the journal entries that this man has somehow gained the ability to project his memories into someone else's mind the moment before they wake up, and that he had been doing this to Takuya. He also designed his apartment to look just like Takuya's and mentioned forgetting to lock his door once. So I guess that means the time Takuya found the parkas and paper on his bathroom mirror were actually in Gobara's apartment that he mistook for his own. This also explains the murders from 10 years ago when Gobara must have done the same thing to Tomo Yano, convincing him that he had done the crimes. With the true killer finally arrested, Takuya tries to move on with his life, but is still faced with terror as Gobara invades his memory every morning. He sees Gobara repeatedly drawing images of him and claiming over and over that he is Takuya. Eventually, when Gabara is sentenced to death and hanged, Takuya gets these memories as well. In fact, as Gabara's life flashes before his eyes when he dies, Takuya is invaded with a whole lifetime of memories. After 10 years, Konami meets up with Takuya. She's covered in scars and mentions that Takuya refused to see her after the attack, blaming himself. She says she's mentally healed and asks Takuya if he has done the same. Takuya mentions how hard it was to experience the memory of someone else's death, but says he's thankful to have shared the pain. He then turns his head and his face seems to resemble that of Gabara. And that is slumber. Okay, that's all I got for you this week, and I'll be back next time with even more Junji Ito, so stay tuned. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like the intro and outro music that's likely playing right now, go check out Kill Me Katie, and of course, big shout out to my patrons. If you want your name displayed at the end of every video like these fine people, consider becoming a patron, where you'll get access to some bonus content. But I appreciate you guys watching at all. This is Grease speaking. Goodbye, friends. Yeah.